Okay, a couple of days ago, or you know, a day or so ago, I talked about having a having read the WikiLeaks release on the DPRK. Now, I should say specifically, this is a Department of Defense North Korea country handbook, Marine Corps intelligence activity. So this is the United States own intelligent gather intelligence gathering on the DPRK. What's significant here is that this is for their own internal use. This was never meant for public publication. So what you're going to see here is a lot more of what they really think as opposed to what it is they say publicly to slander the country. Now, of course, they're not going to agree with the DPRK. They're still going to hate it. But they're going to be more honest about what it is they really think because this is not a public document. Now, this was released by WikiLeaks in a cache of things that was let out after Julian Assange was arrested. This isn't like the, the big one that they're going to release if Assange is executed or something like that. So, one of the things I did notice, very interesting about it, is that they say the long-form name of North Korea is Democratic People's Republic of Korea, DPRK. Yet, they insist upon calling the country North Korea, even though they acknowledge that North Korea is not the name. They refuse, they flat out refuse to use the term DPRK. All right, that's fine. They're, they're going to be that way about it. You know, they already, you know, have used chemical weapons against the DPRK. They've already gassed people, murdered them, destroyed their soil. So, I mean, what's really them being insulting using the name compared to that? Now, I should note that this document is from 1997. So this was when... Uh, this is still technically a, you know, still coming out of the arduous march in which things were worse than they had ever been due to the loss of the Soviet Union, which was 80% of their trade, I believe, and also the, uh, the drought that swept across uh, much of that area, being South Korea, China uh, as well. So keep in mind, that's the context in which they're talking about this. Now, I, I noticed that they use, they use the term Stalinist dictatorship. Now, I've always liked the term Stalinist dictatorship because Stalinism is not a thing. There is no Stalinism. Stalinism is something Trotsky made up to attack people who disagree with him. And something that uh, imperialists use or reactionaries use in order to slander a country to basically call it a totalitarian evil state where 150 billion people died, dot, dot, dot. So it's interesting to note that the United States government in their own intelligence reports are calling it a Stalinist type dictatorship, which if that's something that's significant to Stalin, I would like to know what they think the difference between Lenin and Stalin was. But I'm going to probably guess that they don't see there as being any real difference, but for some reason are specifically using Stalin's name to attack him. Now, when we look at a lot of what's in the document is like military things. Of course, this is a Department of Defense, you know, oper intelligence thing. So uh, obviously most things are going to be about uh, military capacity. Unfortunately... That's not something that I know. I don't know anything about military tactics or things like that. Even I don't know very much about military technology. So I really can't say very, really anything about that because it's not my area of expertise. So I'm not going to comment on that, but I am going to make the document, I'm going to link to the document in the description so that you can see for yourself. And if you do know those kinds of things, you can go over them and see for yourself what's what. But it is very interesting to note a few major things. Their military is massive and prepared. Okay, now uh, more on to the civilian side. One thing to note is that the DPRK has far more railroads than the South. Now, the North has 4,000 in 1997, had 4,915 kilometers of railroad, whereas the South only had 3,149. But by comparison, there was more roads in South Korea than there was in the DPRK. Now, when you're trying to do things more efficiently, 
uh, in terms of mass transportation of goods, raw materials, etc., yeah, you're, you're going to use railroads, and they're far better to use than roads. You should also note that there are far less cars in the DPRK than there are in the South, so you would obviously need less roads as a result. But it's interesting to note that uh, the DPRK economy was more particularly geared towards economic production than say the south was and we can we can go into that up until about the 70s the dprk was actually ahead of the south in terms of uh, development which was largely <laughs> pardon the expression railroaded by the soviet union's destruction and then the famine which uh, swept swept the country now when they start talking about north korean society in general they they make they, they they share a very interesting quote here. Traditionally, Koreans have never conceived of a society as an aggregate of individuals, each pursuing private ends, but as a harmonious collective whole, more important than the individuals composing it. This emphasis on harmony has you know they say justified the DPRK's government paternalistic intervention in the lives of people, of of, of course, because that's the way that they would view socialism in general. But you do notice that basically they note that liberalism is just like not a thing. They're not concerned with it at all. It's not even a thing inside their society. Now, this is liberalism in many forms, not just in uh, social liberalism, but uh, liberalism more as in the, the classical sense of everybody pursuing their own economic ends. And somehow that creates a greater good for everybody, which is very interesting because you know the, the defense of free market capitalism that everybody searching by their own means and doing whatever it is that they want will somehow collect a greater good. But if you plan a greater good in a more planned economy, organized society, then it's bad. It's very interesting to acknowledge that they're saying, oh, well, you know, doing things for the greater good is basically the road to hell. But then saying that they're, idea of just everybody doing whatever it is they want for their own ends will create that same or will also create a collective greater good which kind of makes them complete hypocrites and in the end kind of really undermines a lot of the argument that they actually make so it's interesting to note that uh it has it wasn't even really socialism that put this anti-liberal idea in them but the fact that this has always been there this has always been a part of their culture. So that transition to a essentially a, a socialism of the same kind of general social idea was easy to make because largely they were already there. So that was one of the advantages that uh, socialism in uh, the DPRK had over other countries in the world, which certainly did have a more individualistic approach. For example, um, you could point to uh, Cuba today where you have a great deal of the small you know, peasant farmers who refuse to join collectives, and they're very adamant about remaining independent small farmers. But you don't really have that in the DPRK. Well, you do now to a, an extent now that there's, you know, a mass privatization of land, essentially. But that's, you know, a, a different generation. That's not specific to the document that we're talking about here. But now here we're talking about, uh, we're, we're going to get more into the military aspect because this is this is some of the stuff that I kind of can comment on. Uh, they say the DPRK remains one of the most militaristic states. It commits roughly 25% of its GDP to military spending. Out of every 1,000 people, 40 serve in uniform, which is a very, very high number. And though they're not criticizing the DPRK for it, although I'm sure they would, but this is it's important to note that they're just stating the facts rather than forming an argument or really attacking. And that's kind of the point of... Uh, intelligence gathering in, in this regard. Because if we wanted to talk about countries using their GDP to you for militarism, then the United States would win hands down. Now, by comparison, the ROK, or the Republic of Korea, spends 4% of its GDP on its military and 14 of every 1,000 people serve in uniform. So that's significantly less. Um, we, of course, attribute this to the Songon principle and the fact that the DPRK has been under threat of invasion and 
well, still technically in a state of war, but under threat of invasion and essentially nuclear annihilation from the United States for decades on end. In other words, we can largely attribute their survival to this military first policy. So I'm not saying that it was bad to do this. I'm saying if you want to survive in this type of situation, you're going to have to do that. Now, the DPRK uh, uses imposing forces in terms of numbers. Over 1.2 million personnel serve in the active forces, with a reserve force totaling over 5 million, making it the fourth largest army military force in the world. Now, that's significant considering the country is only the size of Pennsylvania. So that that's significant. Something that's only Pennsylvania having like the fourth largest army in the world. Think about that. And the majority of the DPR cases are deployed in a forward and attack positions within 65 kilometers of the demilitarized zone. Obviously, that's 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 going to be the flashpoint of any conflict that the DPRK is involved in. This concentration on the border supports a military strategy that is directed against the Republic of Korea. Now, obviously, because a state of war still technically exists, and if there's going to be an invasion from the U.S., it is going to have to come from the South. So, obviously, that's where you would put your forces. Now, I, I notice here that the, the United States refers refuses to refer to the military as the KPA, the Korean People's Army. They refer to it as the NKA, the North Korean Army. So so once again, we see that really petty, that real pettiness that they're not willing to refer to them by their proper name for whatever reason. I don't know what that's supposed to accomplish, but it's there nonetheless. Now, they're saying that the major units of the DPRK Army are eight conventional corps, one armored corps, four mechanized corps, two artillery corps, one capital defense command, 30 infantry divisions, four infantry brigades, 15 armored brigades, and 20 motorized mechanized infantry brigades. That is massive. 30 infantry divisions. And for infantry brigades. For something that's the size of Pennsylvania. That is incredible. That's a huge, huge number of people. And to have the, uh, the motorized brigades numbering 20, that is, that is massive. Which means that the DPRK military is uh, more mobile than people think it is. So you're looking at a very huge mass number of military forces that were beyond a lot of um, quote-unquote expert uh, analysis. At, at that time, this was far, far beyond that. And to notice that uh, in terms of mobility, it's really, really way up there. Now, there's a lot of stuff about um, Navy... Uh, technical specs on the amount on the actual vehicles used, which I don't know anything about, and about their air force, but that's all very technical stuff that I I wouldn't that you would have to find a, a connoisseur of Soviet uh, military technology who'd be able to go through that, and I'm, I'm not one of them, so I, I can't I can't do that for you. But um, and then there's a whole thing about actual battlefield tactics that they believe that the North Koreans would use, but I don't. I, I, again, I, I don't know military tactics, so I couldn't really comment on it. But what's interesting, but in the list of technology, it's believed that the DPRK, at least in 1997, had access to Stinger missiles. Now, this is a U.S. weapon. Now, there's no... Um, they essentially don't have any proof that the DPRK had them, but they also have reason to believe that they do but also don't know how the DPRK actually got them or, you know, why they would they would be there or, or how they got there. Now, there's another section on biological warfare. Now, we have heard, oh, the DPRK has weapons of mass destruction. You know, they've got the biological weapons. They've got the chemical weapons, dot, dot, dot. The same kind of thing that we hear about everybody. But it's interesting that this is exactly what they say. 
Biological warfare has not received the same attention as chemical or nuclear warfare. However, if the DPRK did choose to employ biological weapons, it could probably use infectious agents such as those causing anthrax, the plague, against CFC forces. So essentially they're saying biological weapons are just not a priority to the DPRK, despite the fact that we have continually been told that. And I don't just mean now. I mean, now you might be able to claim things are different, of course, no evidence of that. But at the time, now we know that back then when they were claiming the DPRK was full of biological weapons, that it simply wasn't true. That there wasn't even a priority on that their own intelligence tells them. But that's not what they told the public, of course. So it's interesting, even though the United States possibly has the largest chemical weapon stockpile in the world, they're hand biological, they're essentially pointing to everybody else. Now, they say the DPRK has plans to operate in a chemically contam contaminated environment. Now, this is true. The chemical defense units are, or, are organic to combat units down to the regiment level. For example, an Army Corps has a dedicated chemical defense battalion and a regiment has a subordinate chemical defense platoon. These chemical defense units have both the detection and can decontamination systems. Their missions include reconnaissance and the training of personnel in the use of protective equipment. Chemical training and exercises for both military and civilian personnel have increased consistently over the years, meaning they are massively prepared to deal with chemical and biological weapons because these were already used against the DPRK previously. Now, the U.S. has always denied using chemical weapons in the Korean War. And in the, the U.S. soldiers who came out and admitted that they did were considered to have been commie brainwashed. I mean, that's a whole separate subject altogether, something that you could research yourself and is beyond the scope of this document and beyond the scope of this video. But it's important to note that this was definitely something that they were prepared for because they had, they knew that it happened in the past. Now, finally, in terms of uh, at least military application, uh, there's nearly 60,000 mil uh, military personnel assigned to the 22 Special Operations Forces, Brigades, and Light Infantry Battalions that would be able to open a second front in the CFC's rear area. That's a massive force. That is huge for something that would be used in that situation. Now, I, again, I, I'm not anywhere near an expert. I don't have any education on military tactics. I wouldn't even know where to begin. I had somebody, somebody who did understand these things tell me how significant that was. Now, that's basically all I want to say for this document because a lot of it is statistical information about weather... Uh, climate, population, and like I said, the bulk of the document is military tactics. There's stuff in there about uh, rank, insignia, rank insignias, uh, the military hardware used by the country, and a lot of it is stuff that we already knew. But I, I tried to just focus on a few important points in this rather than making one huge blanket video that would be repeating a lot of things that we essentially already know. So I didn't want to waste time by going through all that. And this video has already come out you know, longer than I had anticipated it to be. So if you do want to know more about uh, the DPRK, at least what U.S. intelligence says about the DPRK, in 1997, then I suggest going to the link in the description. However, I should note that if you are an American citizen, uh, technically it says, warning, although classified, the use of this publication is restricted to official military and U.S. government personnel. So let that know. I, I'm not an American. They can't do anything to me. And besides, I mean, what are you going to do? Censor WikiLeaks is already out there anyway. And not to mention the fact that this is essentially, this is decades old information anyway. So whether or not it's really worth them coming after someone for, I have no idea. But just, just be no, just, just be aware that this is the kind of thing that could possibly happen to you as a result. So uh, that's all I really wanted to make on the statement for the actual document there, just to give you a brief overview of some of the things that are more interesting, but uh, 
there may be more interesting in terms of military technology. I just don't know it. So uh, there you go. There's uh, much, much more. It's a, it's a very long document. So you can decide uh, what you want to do with that for yourself. So head to the link in the description and educate yourself further.